Knowledge is power. Make an impact by learning more. Call us right now for more help at 866-945-8070. What do you say to somebody who says they want to start their own business? All right, so I've got this recording going. Let's hope that Zoom lets me go live on Facebook today. <laughs> on good old book face. Let's see. We're going live. live. We're, oh, we're going live. Big time. Oh, why? Do you need to put on, like, makeup or something? I didn't <laughs> I put any on. Without the makeup, I'm just, really? Oh, you're beautiful, Peggy. Right? Wait, no, I'm talking about my little working area behind you. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Really? All right, it's starting early. Yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) Don't y'all think he could have told me yesterday we were going to go live? Wow. I just assume that everybody is. Oh, I just met you yesterday. That's funny. So today I'm actually prepared. Uh, I'm going to show you exactly what I did to prepare, so that if you ever decide to host your own zoom facebook live show i can show you how to prepare um all right we're clicking go live go live hold on it's preparing it's setting it up you know what's funny is i've learned from watching the playbacks that like it's already recording us for the playback on the Mm -hmm. facebook live okay took me back to facebook nerd enterprises inc is live now Holy cow, I think it's working. Yep. I think it's working. Yep, Hold I on. see it. Hold on, I've got to mute that one feed so I don't get an echo. And then we need to go into between wall and main. And we're live. With. Sarah Laidlaw is watching on Facebook. Oh, you already know that. Awesome. Um, my good old title. This is a long one. What do you say to someone who says, I want to quit my job and start my own business? All right, I'm hitting the post button. So we're live in the Facebook group. We're live on the Facebook page. And if Sarah Laidlaw is here, then we are definitely ready to get started. All right, so before I dig into like the real you know, meat of what I wanted to talk about today, I'll share a quick story with you. It's story time on Zoom in with Seth, David, and friends. <laughs> Once upon a time, in a galaxy far, far away. No, my um, my brother and I discovered when we were kids in elementary school that you know a lot of us kids remember Bazooka Bubblegum, and it would have like the fortune inside. Yeah. So, so you know, kids loved that stuff. We loved it, and we did. My brother actually, I should give credit to for having come up with the idea, but we would buy a box of like a big box of the bubble gum, and then we would sell them in school for like a nickel each, <coughs> and we made a little profit on it, and it started to get momentum. Like, we had the bazooka bubble gum. We were like the bazooka bubble gum dealers, right? So kids would come. The first one was free, and then after that, they were hooked, and everybody- So how old were you and your brother? I, you know, he was probably around the sixth grade, which, which would put me in about the fourth grade. Something like that. So I was like 10, you know, he was like 12 whatever <laughs> the school found out we were doing this after a couple of months and they shut us down so my first business got shut down by the regulatory body under which we were prisoners so that was my story of my very first business venture my brother really was the brains behind it i just followed along and did what he did it's his fault so it's been a long journey since that first poor way into entering entrepreneurism right I'd like to say that I had a story more like Gary Vaynerchuk where he had lemonade stands and he had a bunch of them and he would go on his big wheel from one stand to the next to collect his cut he was like a pimp ah. for lemonade stands yes, <laughs> so, but um, yours is a valuable valuable story know the regulations <laughs> the rules <laughs> that's right you know how to or you me. get shut down <laughs> and that is still relevant today that's true that's very true ah so i wonder if gary vaynerchuk like owes all kinds of back sales taxes from this sale (laughs) or how many permits he didn't get (laughs) exactly that's what they're doing to the poor alex 
lemonade stand people now. No, there's been cases though where they've said, you know, this is, you know, like basically the, the courts have ruled and, and putting it in simple terms, they've said, look, guys, don't be ridiculous. These are just kids doing something and it's a good learning experience for them. And we're not, because people were trying to do that and say, oh, these guys need to pay taxes. And, you know, it's, it was ridiculous. But some people just have nothing better to do. There's also an organization and basically they're there to like, if you, if you get fined for it, if the kids get fined for it, they can contact them and they'll pay their legal fees and all that stuff. Good. Good. Cause that's ridiculous. That just reeks of somebody who went through high school feeling inadequate the whole four years. And now they're trying to make up for it by, you know, putting pressure on little poor little kids running lemonade stands. Cause, th cause that's how they get to feel powerful. So anyway, I want to I want to show you something. I want to, I want to show you something. All right. So here's I actually here's how I actually got organized this time, right? Sharing my screen. Everybody can see my screen. Mm -hmm. I, I I I jump back into Evernote. Here I have the registration URL, even the image that I had, you know, the little slide I create. So and then this is the Google Doc link. So I click on this and it opens up my Google Doc. Of course now I have it open three times. <laughs> And just kind of like I just always write like some notes so I know what I want to talk about when I'm talking about whatever it is that I want to talk about. So I don't forget what I wanted to talk about. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> um, oh, look, my friend Jorge joined. Hey, Jorge. And Alexa, Alexa Gregory says hello. Hello, Alexa Gregory. Gina, you're there live too. Tanya's there. Hi, Tanya. Tanya commented, so last night, late at night when I was writing my lovely notes for this morning, um, Gina, Tanya, and somebody else had some great suggestions for like upcoming Zoom and calls. So next week, we are going to do tips and tricks for content creators. Thank you. That one's kind of for you too, because I know we were talking about that yesterday. So, so definitely make sure you join us next week for that. And then the following week, I'm going to do something that's sort of broadly based on what somebody suggested. I had posted on my personal Facebook feed last night. Um, uh, she described a situation where she's had, a, I guess, like a personal setback and how to get motivated to get kind of back in the game, right? How Stella got her groove back, something like that, but applied to business. Remember that movie? How Stella got her groove back? That was a great movie, actually. <laughs> Did you see it? We're gonna call it how Adam got his groove, how Batman got his groove back. There you go. <laughs> so, true story. Oh, it's not. What the? What? I have it on my image to still be there. I don't know what the guy, what you guys are doing with the Zoom thing. Oh, there. you don't have Batman <coughs> anymore. Um, so that's a, that's a shame, Adam. That's a shame. You know, ill prepared. So. That was a pretty good catch, Adam. Right. <laughs> what do you catch? Why? Was there something like inappropriate that was about to go up on our screens? No, no it's just something I inappropriate had... about to come out his mouth. <laughs> oh, the, oh, he yeah, he held back the f bomb. No, I have, I have like, my Batman logo here, and ate... it's on my profile, but it isn't on here. Oh. You ate the f bomb. How did that f bomb taste, Adam? Pretty good. Oh, pretty he good. Swallowed, he swallowed that one real good. Yeah, he, did. <laughs> he almost choked on it. Um, <laughs> so coming home last night, I pull up, all of a sudden I hear somebody calling my name, which I honestly thought I was hearing things because I don't normally expect people to be talking to me as I'm pulling up in my car in my driveway. And it was actually my next door neighbor who I think they've been here a couple of years now, but it took a while before we sort of, uh, you know, had a chance to stay alone, get to know each other. And when we eventually did me being me, I invited him to go to breakfast because he's a guy about my age, I think maybe a few years younger. And uh, he seemed like a nice guy. So we went to breakfast, learned a little bit about one another. He works for Warner Brothers, and he has a really interesting job, actually. He works like cybersecurity at Warner Brothers. His job is to protect and make sure nobody can hack in and steal their content. Because remember how Sony had some stuff stolen by, I think it was, was it North Korea? Who stole, like, Sony content and then put it out on the web just to kind of undermine them and make them lose money. Um, anyway, that was a thing for a while. So guys like him have the job of making sure nobody can do that. You know, so it's all cybersecurity, internet security. And uh, so as I'm getting out of my car, I realize it is in fact a real person talking to me. I'm not just hearing things. And 
he's actually, he says, do you have a minute? And I said, sure. And he says, you know, I, you know, long story short, he says, you know, I'm really thinking seriously about leaving Warner Brothers and, you know, starting my own business, you know, like a cybersecurity firm kind of thing. Right. And I said, I think it's a great idea. I said, first of all, I think it's a great idea to start your own business. But then I started thinking because he didn't actually ask the question, but the, the question was inherent. He's basically saying, what do I do? Where do I start? Right. So I thought, what a great subject, because I see it asked sometimes in our groups on Facebook. People will say, hey, you know, I have somebody who's asking me this question. And ultimately, it's some version or variation on the theme of, what do you say to somebody who says, I want to quit my job and start my business? So what do you think the first thing I said to him was? Don't. You want to take what? Don't. Yeah, run away. <laughs> run away. <laughs> well, the first thing you say is good luck, and then you start. <laughs> Well, I mean, I get a lot of questions from Universal because I'm still their academic coordinator for the bookkeeping program there. And now QuickBooks, I just learned today. Oh, Universal uh, Accounting. I was thinking Universal Studios because I'm in the <laughs> mindset. Of well, no, Universal Accounting. But, uh, I mean, on top of the bookkeeping questions, that's a lot of the questions I get because I'm like the I think I'm the only one who actually is accessible and actually answers, you know, they'll ask me, well, how, what do I do? What's the software I use? How do I get my LLC? What do I, you know, everything like that. So, right. And it's kind of like, well, what's your process? What do you, what do you want your clients to be? What's your niche going to be? All that stuff. So that was actually one of the first questions I asked him. I said, I want, you know, I said, so I, actually the very first thing I said to him was, I said, don't quit your job yet. <laughs> you know, I, I, I made sure I warned him that I said, don't quit your job. Cause I know, cause I live next to you. You have a wife, you have kids. I assume you're paying a mortgage there next door. And, you know, so we want to make sure that's protected. And, and that brought up act, the actual first thing I said beyond that, which is something I remembered that I did when I first got the idea to go start my own business, which is kind of before all the things you just said, Adam, because all the things you just said are the things I would normally think of first to say to somebody, you know, think about who your clients are going to be, where are you going to go find them? How are you going to get them and all that? But I said, before we get into that, like the very first thing I would want to say to somebody, you know, that I wanted to say to him is do me a favor, put together a household budget, figure out what it costs you to live so that you have an idea of how much you need to make from that business before you quit your job. I really think that's so important. And I, I just never hear anybody say that. You know, I thought of it when I, when I was so scared, I wasn't going to be able to pay my bills that I wasn't gonna be able to make enough money to pay my bills. Right. And so I remember spending hours toiling over my spreadsheets, making sure that I miss anything. And you know, little things that you don't think about until, until they smack you in the face somehow, like, you know, for a guy like him, he probably has really good health benefits with a company like Warner Brothers, right? So, um, you know, now he's going to have to pay for that out of his own pocket. You know, but sure, maybe he can get a Cobra plan for six months to a year, or however that works these days. It's been so long for me, I don't know. But that's going to run out, and then he's going to have to pick up his own insurance tab, and that can be costly. I know what I pay for insurance for myself and my wife, you know. And that's not something you want to screw around with, especially as you get – a little bit on in years like past the age of 35 like up to 35 i think we all think we're invincible so it doesn't matter like we don't need yeah. that insurance, right yeah. and 35 you start to realize i'm not i'm actually not invincible anymore I used to. so those are some of the first things i realized that this is what i want to say to the guy like put a household budget together if you don't already have one make sure you have a very clear picture of what you're going to need to make in that business before you start that business then we can start putting together the business's picture. How are we going to get clients? Where are we going to get clients? Who are those clients going to be? Because I said, for the kind of services you offer, I don't think a smaller business, even though everybody should probably have something like this or think about it at least, um, they may not be able to afford him based on you know sort of the level where he works at when it comes to this kind of stuff. I mean, especially coming from doing it for a company like the WB, I think that his target audience is going to be probably companies that are doing at least a million dollars a year in revenues. You could, cause he was talking to me about, Oh, should I go on Fiverr? And I said, please don't go on Fiverr. I yeah. said, cause Fiverr comes from the word five, which puts us in a mindset of you're going to get paid five bucks to do something. Right. So at least that's how I kind of think of Fiverr. Like I, so I was, I was, I was like, you're not going to, you're going to, you, are you putting the house on the market? Cause that's what's going to happen if you go on Fiverr, you know? And so these are the considerations um, you know, that I think have to be, you know, taken into account when we're thinking about doing something like this, especially quitting a really good job 
to go become your own boss. And then I told them a little bit of my own experience when I, you know, when I started this, I didn't quit my job at all. I started building it on the side. And then when I had enough, I gave notice and actually still maintained, uh, I, I turned myself into a contractor with the CPA firm where I worked because there was a project that they really kind of still wanted my help with. So I went to two days a week with them and I had clients on the side. And then eventually I found a client who really needed me about three days a week. So I left the CPA firm entirely and I worked at this marketing company three days a week and had my clients on the side until I eventually built it up enough uh, to where I actually parted company with that marketing company and then I was truly and completely on my own. So I did it very slowly. You know, and I did it very sort of deliberately and with a lot of planning and focus and you know I, I sat down with my spreadsheets and I you know in those days of course everything was by the hour so I said how many hours can I bill what rate can I charge what's that going to translate to in terms of gross income <clears throat> and what are my expenses going to be from the business and then after that is there enough left to cover all those personal expenses that I figured out I'm going to need to make sure I have covered right so I uh, you know, that I just, I, out of fear, really, more than anything else, I spent a lot of time planning this and making sure that I wanted to make sure it was set up. I didn't want it to be like a struggle. I didn't want to be reaching, right? I wanted to make sure that it was going to be easy, that I was going to set myself up for success and not struggle to succeed. And so I did all that kind of planning, and you know, I did what I do best, really, which is, you know, the spreadsheets and the, the financial modeling, really, is what I was doing. So. Let's take a look at some of our comments on Facebook because we have some. Um, I always forget which order these go in, if they're reverse chronological or forward chronological. So Sarah, <coughs> I'm just going to read from the bottom up. Sarah Laidlaw says, I would recommend the E-Myth books by Michael Gerber. She says, benefits is the one thing that stops most people in their tracks. Uh, her question is, are you entrepreneur-minded or craft-minded? Knowing your craft is only the first step. Uh, that's true. And it's, it takes a lot more than just knowing what you're doing. Right. And that is absolutely true. I think there are a lot of people out there that are like excellent and experts in their field, but what they're not experts or know anything about is anything to do with the finances. Right. That and also by stepping away from a job and going into the role of business owner or entrepreneur, especially if you're starting out and assuming you don't have all kinds of seed money to get started with, then you are the marketing person, you are the accountant, you are the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, you're doing it all, right? So you better be prepared to go out there and hustle and find ways to bring the business in. And that, of course, is where I did end up gearing the conversation with my neighbor last night. I started talking to him, of course, about content and identifying who and where your targets are and creating content for that particular target audience. And I told him, and I, I'm so careful to say this now because oftentimes I've noticed if I don't clarify it, it gets misconstrued, that when you do produce content, I said to him, I said, the, the key to producing content that's going to be effective is I said, you have to educate not sell right and I said if you educate people you will attract the crowd of people who will either become clients or refer those will become clients and then what I'm I learned finally, I'm finally doing that IOLTA presentation that I kind of do last year nice so have you done it yet or I ha I'm actually become a really big fan of Amanda Aguilar and I think her idea okay. about two sets of books is just brilliant and it's really one for the trust account and one for the actual business. Okay. Because it just simplifies it so much and just, you know, eliminates a lot of confusion. And it does make it easy. That, that sort of model there as well. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, and that's what I said to him. I said, if you educate people and, and more importantly, taking a page out of John Ferrara's book. And by the way, we started recording our podcast for the authentic accountant. First one is going live on August 7th. And I got to interview John Ferrara last week for it. And one of the things that he reminded me of that I've listened to and learned from and actually found it to be very effective is when you're creating content aimed at attracting a particular target market, what you really want to do in terms of strategy is not create content or, or not necessarily aim to put that content directly in the hands of the end users of it, of the people who might actually hire you. You want to find out. So we use, we talk about industry. We talk about finding a niche, right? <clears throat> That's the easiest way to do this because once you identify a niche, like one of mine is real estate brokers and agents, right? 
<coughs> so I did a Google search recently because I was curious, who are the influencers in the real estate industry? And so I, I did a very literal Google search, influencers in the real estate industry, and found an article that was like the top 18 influencers for real estate in 2017. I'm like, well, that's not too long ago. I don't see an article for 2018, maybe because 18 isn't done yet. So I bookmarked that list and I said, these are the people I want to be friends with, right? And so I'll start making sure I follow them on Twitter and connect with them on LinkedIn and start a conversation. And then they'll see my content that I put out there that talks about how to record a HUD-1 final settlement statement or a closing disclosure statement. And my content on how to record the sale of a property for a real estate broker and then how to do it from the agent's perspective and so on. So I've got this sort of mountain of content that I've already done for the real estate market. And now that I connect with these people and they connect back with me, and it's not just following them and hoping for a follow back, it's actually reaching out to them and you know saying something and getting their attention and, and getting in on their conversations, watching what they're talking about and looking at what they're doing and, and actually engaging and saying, hey, you know what, I love that article you just wrote. Because if I start complimenting on them on their content, but the key is I actually have to read it and actually have to care, right? In other words, don't just do this gratuitously because you're hoping to get business out of it. Do it because you care and want to get in, into the conversation. That's the way it should be. Otherwise, you're going to fail, right? And I don't mean to sound harsh. It's just the reality. You have to be authentic. That's why I called my podcast The Authentic Accountant because I believe firmly – the importance of authenticity in everything you do. So what will happen, though, is they'll start to see what I'm doing because I've shown an interest in what they're doing, and hopefully they'll like it and say to their followers and likers and subscribers, hey, you got to check this guy's stuff out. You're going to love it. And all these influencers want is really good content to continue to add value to your audience, right? So if you can help them provide content based on your angle on things, which might be the accounting and bookkeeping, heaven forbid, then that's, that's your way in, right? That's your ticket into that community. That's how you get to hang out with the, with the cool kids in whatever industry it is that you're hoping to serve. So I kind of talked to him along those lines and said, this is the stuff you want to think about. And then as he was about to go back into his house, I said, but please don't quit your job yet. <laughs> you know? um, and so I, I was just, like I said, I thought it would be a great topic of conversation. So Adam, you said that you have a lot of people that still reach out to you with answers to these questions and you, you, you shared some great ideas. So I would love to hear more about maybe just some of what you've taken out of the conversations you've had with these people. It's just interesting. The perspective that, you know, the people have, I mean, it's, it just seems like, you know, they're fo so focused on this, the bookkeeping program is they're not, I mean, the, the thing that I get is there's a, there's a lack of planning on the backside of, okay, now I'm, you know, I'm studying to become a business owner to own my own bookkeeping business, but how am I going to do it? What software am I going to use? Uh, what's my location going to be? What's my niche going to be? How am I going to get clients? How am I, how am I going to market to clients? What's my pricing going to be? Um, all that back end stuff is just not even a thought. And I just, you know, I always bring it home. I said, you really need, you know, once you're doing this bookkeeping course, you need in your site that you're going to do it. You need to have all these plans. Cause when I, when I first started, I knew I was going to st start this thing. So I was planning for months and month, like six months. I basically was just writing outlines of how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And I'm still testing and I'm still writing outlines. I just wrote an outline yesterday about my SEO strategy that took right. like two hours. So, um, yeah. so yeah, you, you, and I tell them you need to be constantly planning, organizing, writing things. Cause you're going to change a lot. You're going to change your pricing. You're going to change your marketing. You're going to change right. it. That's true. That is so true. And so you really need to be in the habit of being just like super vigilant, organized and constantly testing, you know, every quarter test. Is this working? Is it, if it's not, then we're going to do something else. Is this working? If not, we're going to do something else. Is this app working? Is the software working? Is it the best fit for me? Is desktop better? Is you know, online better? Is right. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Adam, because what you just described is very much the lean startup method. So Sarah, yeah, yeah. E-Myth Books, I'm going to add on. We should start. Somebody start making notes and compile our reading list because I think we're going to start listing a bunch of resources for reading, for podcasts, because the lean startup, there it is. And that is part of the recommended reading in the 97 and up the hard, program. What? The Hard Thing About the Hard Things. That's an awesome book. Mm -hmm. It's by Ben Horowitz, 
who actually probably could be credited as one of the group who started the internet. So, because it was him and Mark Andreessen and how to write copy that sells Adams holding up, which is the actual book that we've done a book study on in 97 and up. In our 97 and up outline, by the way, at the bottom of the course outline, I have our reading list and these books are all on it. But the Lean Startup talks about the importance of testing and what was really cool about it, and this will hit home for a lot of us, is Eric Ries, the author, describes in the book how he consulted with Intuit many, many years ago. And Intuit, I believe to this day, still very much employs the strategies and principles that Eric teaches in the Lean Startup, because it's all about testing. You know, you don't throw a whole bunch of money at something, you put a little bit of money or resources into it, test it, and measure the results. And he talks about a process where, and he's writing this really aimed at app developers, but it, it can be taken out of that context and I think put into many other contexts. You just have to learn how to read it for what's sort of underneath the surface and figure out how to apply this stuff in what we all do. And so I can, if I have an idea for a service I want to offer as a bookkeeping service, I can throw it out there, test it, I can put it up <coughs> in social media and see, are people interested in this? Do they like this? And if I don't get a good reaction, then maybe I scrap it and move on to something else. But if immediately people say, hey, Seth, I love this idea, then I start working on it and I cultivate it and I add to it and I might revise my pricing for it and so on, like Adam was just describing. Um, so I love what you just shared there, Adam, because that is the Lean Startup process. You test and measure. The problem is we do a lot of testing, but I think what we sort of fall short on the measurement part. We forget to measure and go back and check the results and see, is this really working? Is this something people really want? Well, yeah, I mean, every quarter I'm always looking at my revenue numbers from one quarter to the next going, did I make my goals? If not, you know, what's the thing that maybe changed? You know, what's some of the tools I can add or remove that will help me be more efficient? Right. Are you still using your 97 and up template for that? No. <laughs> okay. Cool. I won't take it personally. I disagree, I disagree with the pricing the structure. Policy. That's just my personal thing. No, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I created a template because it was, it, it was an exact example of what I'm talking about, really, because I created something that I felt I needed for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, this might be of use to others. But when I, I was on a call with a client of mine yesterday, and earlier this year, I created a different sort of variation on the theme of having some kind of a template where you track everything. And I called it a cash flow map. Because at one point, I thought, you know, it'd be really useful, especially in a business model like mine, which is very much subscription based. I mean, even my consulting clients are on a subscription. They, you know, a monthly fee comes in every month, like clockwork same day so I can map that out and literally see exactly what my cash flows are going to look like throughout the month I know exactly what day this client pays and how much I know exactly what day another client pays and how much and so I map that all out to gauge my cash flow so I look at my net cash flow literally for every single day of the month and then I can plan and I can say you know what I've got this expense coming up I know it's going to be this much let me drop it in there and see what that's going to do to my cash flow I know twice a month I've got payroll it's going to be so much you know, I, I just want to make sure the goal really is never to have to put money into the business, right? And always make sure I'm cash flow positive because I should only ever be, well, I shouldn't even be taking money out of the business. I was about to say the wrong thing. We were just talking about that yesterday. My goal is not to take money out of the business. My goal is to take sufficient payroll to cover my personal expenses and then to leave money in the business to grow the equity of my business. And that would be another piece of advice I would start giving to a brand new business owner or somebody who wanted to be one is that another mistake I think a lot of us make in starting a business is we just think of it as a uh, as like a water faucet for our household right and we forget that maybe and maybe that's good enough for some people it probably is and if that's the case that's fine but I think a lot of people forget to think about the fact that really if you want to build something and grow it then we need to retain the profits and keep some of that money in the business and stop taking distributions and stop worrying about playing games with things like an S corp so I can take out distributions tax free because to me that's very small thinking when the thinking should be how do I get it so that I can pay myself a $200,000 a year salary so I can max out a SEP IRA plan and, and do it the right way. You know what I mean? So I'm paying into social security and Medicare, but also I've got tax free savings and deferred um, you know, tax deferred savings going in through a SEP IRA plan, because if I'm paying myself a salary of 200000 then I can max out the 45% max contribution into a plan like that. And I'm just using that as one example. My point is we get hung up and, oh, I want to pay myself the lowest salary possible so I can avoid the Social Security and Medicare tax. 
And in reality, you should be thinking much bigger than that. You should be thinking, how do I get so much business that I can pay myself $200,000? So that also depends on your tax planning strategies. You also don't want to max yourself out when you're paying, you know, crazy tax, crazy amounts of taxes. I mean, I had a client where, you know, he's an LLC and we switched him to an S corp just because he was paying, you know, more in self-employment taxes than he was actually paying in income taxes. Right. Right. But I think if we, if I'm thinking in terms of trying to max out my salaries at 200,000 a year, which I think is gonna be considered more than reasonable com- compensation for an officer for almost any industry out there, probably fair to say. Um, you know, again, I can now take advantage of retirement plans to defer my taxes, dollar one gross off the top, right? So I think that's the way we should be thinking strategy-wise, when we're st- especially when we're starting out a new business, and then of course, well into, you know, and well beyond when we've started a new business. Um, you know, I, I just think that again, I just, I got off on a tangent with that, but cause it always, it's like a hot button for me now because I was guided in the beginning, set up an S corp so you can take distributions and not have to pay taxes on it. Right. And, and I did that for a while. And then you know, what else I did, cause the, the plan based on that guidance was I'm just going to run one big payroll at year end and get all the taxes paid. In. And it, it does count, by the way, as though you had paid it evenly throughout the year when you do that through payroll like that. I've seen arguments back and forth about it, but the research I've done suggests that you can do that. You can run, run big payroll in December, right, just to get the taxes paid in, zero out the net pay because you don't actually need the paycheck, you just need the taxes in, and you'll be penalty free on that basis. You, if you pay through payroll, you do not have to pay evenly all year. It gets treated as though you had. So, you know, what, what would happen though is I'd wait till the end of the year and we'd figure out what my tax liability was. And based on that, I had to run whatever payroll it was to get the right amount of taxes paid in. And guess what? I didn't have the money. So I wasn't able to run the payroll to get enough taxes paid in. And now I'm getting this big tax bill and I'm going on payment plans with the IRS in the early years of when I started my business. So eventually I got smart and learned. I'm just going to pay myself a monthly salary broken up into two. And I don't need to take the net check on those. Right. So I just zero out my net check and that goes as an offset to whatever distributions I may have taken out of the company. So in the end, I've got plenty of payroll on the books. I've got my taxes paid in cash flow wise. I can handle it because I'm doing it monthly instead of trying to do it all at once at the end of the year. And then I'm living within my means and everything actually worked perfectly that way. Let me ask a question. Someone told me, um, I can't remember who it was, that if you're LLC, that you can't, um, take the payroll out of your business? Well, I think you don't want to because as an LLC, it's a flow through and you're going to get hit with self-employment tax anyway. So I think as an LLC to take officer payroll, you're just paying an extra taxes unnecessarily. Okay. All right, guys. All right. If, if there's anything I've learned from working with you, Seth, and kind of following everything is, is you build habits. So I tend to tell clients that are looking at that option to just do a base salary, do a true up quarterly if it makes sense before you hit the year end because you're never going to have the money sometimes. People are just not that way. So I like to build the habits and getting into the, the style of like think about, about it this way. And then they build from it and they do a better job. So. Yep. Yep. And then also when you're setting up your budgets, there should be a line item that represents a savings of some sort that it, it gets treated just like a utility bill. It has to get paid no matter what. You know, which is kind of like my variation on Mike's profit first method, right? Where he says, you take the money out up front. Here's what my profit needs to be. And, you know, with him, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong. With him, you set up a separate bank account and move the money in it, right? I don't feel that I need to do that. I understand the reasoning behind doing it that way. And for some people, that probably helps. Yeah, I do both. I'm an S Corp and I still do the tax account. So I pay myself monthly and I have, so I'm running payroll through me monthly. And then I also have that tax account set up so when I do have taxes to be paid, that's already there. Right. So I just have a savings account that I move money into for all of it, like whatever I need to shave off. And I had um, just my own sort of simplified version of it all where I said, you know what, I'm just going to take a percentage off the top and every month that's going to get transferred over into savings. And Adam, you actually helped me with this a while back because I remember asking you this question is, you know, what do you do if you're shaving right off the top, you know, to put away your profits first? And and I think you guys also have like some kind of a bonus thing that you- Yeah, profit account. Yeah, so- Profit first. Right, 
but then there's something where I've seen people posting on Facebook who are in profit first, where I guess there's a certain amount that they take in every month or every quarter, they buy themselves something with the money as a way to remind them. And remind yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically what the profit account is for. It is not for business. It's for your personal use for basically re the reward. I, I do it. I mean, I do it every like around Black Friday. <laughs> uh, so, Right. So, which, so, so, and it's a great idea. And I think for some people having the structure of having an actual separate bank account for it is probably needed and important. You know, for me, it's like, as long as I know, you know, and I just did my own simplified version of this where I said, I'm going to take this percentage of dollar one gross off the top. And at any given time during the year, I can run my year to date cash basis P and L. It's one of the only times I run it cash basis to see what I've actually collected this year. And I take, whatever percentage of that. And I compare that with what I've actually put aside this year. Does it agree? Am I over or short? Quite honestly, usually I'm a little short. So I'm like, okay, I got to pay in more to catch up with where I should be. <clears throat> and I asked you the question now, and this is what I wanted to br bring up because I imagine other people have the same question. I said to myself, what is it that, like, what do I do if, if after taking that amount off the top, I just don't have enough to pay the bills? And what you said, Adam, was so simple. I don't know if you remember this conversation that we had, but it was like, it was what I needed to hear. It hit me over the head with the simplicity. It was just like, well, you learn to live a little leaner. You learn to live within those means and you get creative and you learn to figure out how to live on less. And then, and when you start to see the rewards and when you start to see how it pays off, then you, um, then you start to get that much more motivated to do it and stick with it because you realize that come Black Friday, Adam's going to have all the money he needs set aside to buy himself whatever treats and toys he wants for himself, yep. right? So Gina says, uh, let's go back. Sarah says, an LLC can be any kind of business. Forget them. What kind of federal business are they? And I understand what you're saying, Sarah. So you have to consider for the LLC, what kind, how are you filing? Are you filing as a partnership or are you filing as an escort? Because it's how you're filing that really matters there. Single member. So single member LLC is disregarded, right? It's for federal tax purposes. There is no entity. So it's really so like a sole proprietor. I think Sarah wants to say that it's more of a state designation, the LLC, as opposed to federal. When you file your federal return, how do you file that and what do you file that under? Right. But like she said, if it's a single member, there is no federal return for the LLC. It's disregarded. It's considered a sole proprietorship. So you're <laughs> 140 at that point and maybe a Schedule C. Uh, right. Yes. Yeah, Schedule C. Right. So it's, so then you definitely don't need to pay payroll because you're paying, you're getting hit with the self-employment tax. Remember the self-employment tax is 15.3%, which is act, exactly twice 7.65% or 7.6. Yes. Yeah, 7.65 rounded up to is 15.3. And what they're doing there is they're getting their social security and Medicare tax through the self-employment tax, right? Cause social security and Medicare is 7.65%. Normally it's paid 7.65 by the employer, 7.65 by the employee. Add that up. You got your 15.3. So when you become a sole proprietor, it's basically the government says, okay, you're not getting out of paying into social security and Medicare. We're going to get it through the self-employment tax. So Sarah says, if you know the federal rule, you know the LLC rules. And before that, Gina said, are you sure? Maybe they just discovered Seth David are now following. <laughs> um, that was to Sarah's response about Facebook. The, the previous, um, she said, oh, why, are she asked, why are my family members watching? Yeah, maybe my reach is just expanding and it's getting huge. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go on a diet. Um, so, 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 I don't know. I, I one of my personal friends jumped on. I don't know if he's still here, Jorge. Um, who I don't imagine would normally be interested in any of this. Maybe he is. Uh, Alexa says, "Approaching Social Security and Medicare." I'm glad you've been paying those taxes. <laughs> so, Alexa's about to collect what we're all paying in, is what she's saying. Well, leave some over for us, Alexa. We're going to need it one day. Um. So let's go back to the original conversation. What do we say to business owners, to people who say, hey, I want to quit my job and start a business? I would love to just go around the horn here. Adam has talked about it some. Gina, what's your advice? My advice is to find a mentor. Join groups and see what other people are doing. You don't have to be competitive. It's not you want everybody and everything. Do it as a collaboration. Work with other people. Learn what's working for them. And take what, you know, and, and make it your own. You don't have to do exactly what they do, 
but learn from their mistakes and what people before you have done and then make it your own. And so what should I look for in a mentor? What should you look for a mentor? Somebody that's doing exactly what you want to do. Somebody that is a success that's there as far as you're concerned. Yep. Somebody who has what you want, right? Exactly. So you're trying to take it away from them. You're trying to learn how to do what they've accomplished. For exactly. Somebody who has, which, and, and actually another variation on that theme that I once heard somebody share, it was in a different context, but it definitely applies here, is look for somebody who has what they want, right? In other words, somebody who's really happy with where they're at, that's who I want to learn from. That's Because that's really what I want for myself, is I want to learn to be happy with where I'm at. Because we get caught up, especially on the entrepreneurial journey, in what's next, what's next, what's next. All right, so I'm now doing 100000 a year. How do I get to half a million? How do I get to a million? We're always looking ahead, and, and there's a tendency and a danger there to forget to enjoy the journey, right? To forget to enjoy what we're doing right now today and what we've accomplished as of today. You know, and because what I've learned, and it's hard to keep this mindset because it's so easy to, you know, move into the future mentally, um, is I often forget that the, what I have experienced firsthand at times is when I learn to truly appreciate where I am today, that's when things start actually getting a lot better really quickly. It's, it's like it just has a way of working that way, right? The more I get up every day and say, you know what, I love my life today. I can't wait to get up and go do what I'm doing every day. The more I'm able to adopt and maintain that mindset, the better things just get. It's like the future takes care of itself at that point. So, Gina, I love that guidance for, uh, for starting a new business. Find a mentor, join groups, get, get, have a mastermind group. Even if it's not a formal one, a group of people that you know you reach out to and you need guidance, right? And that's a lot of what I built 97 and up to be about. Right. And because I know, I mean, I have to give props to Sarah because so many people reach out to me and I guess because maybe I'm busy or whatever, or they think I'm busy. So they reach out to Sarah and so many people have come back to me and said, Sarah has been so helpful because I reached out to Sarah and I had questions. Sarah, how often would you say you're helping somebody in 97 and up with questions? It varies. I think, uh, like I was just talking, I was uh, writing Adam, like, I miss you. I just, I like the connection. I like if we both learn from each other. I wrote um, Kelly earlier in the week because she's doing some of the e-commerce stuff. And I thought, oh, I've got some stuff and why don't we collaborate a little bit and figure out. And um, I think it's just being open to learning, wanting to learn, not feeling threatened because you're engaged with another person who happens to be in the same line of business, just enjoying the process and and uh, kind of like what you said just a little bit ago, um, I, I decided to, earlier this week, I made a decision I'm like, you know what, I'm going to enjoy my week. I'm actually going to go do something with my family, just do something random. And I did. And I loved it. And I was like, that's what I, that's why I'm doing this, because I can take off on a Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. And I love that. And especially, I think and we talked about this, especially for people like us who work remotely, who work from home. You know, or Adam's in an office, but he's in an office by himself, aren't you? So yep. I have a neighbor here now, so I can actually exchange banter. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, he's a he's actually a, a, a business attorney, so we are thinking about partnering That's with. Right. Is he a client yet? That's nice. That is good. <laughs> no, he yeah, just went like two weeks ago. Yeah, Perfect. That's, yeah, that's a great that's a great combination right there. So Sarah, what are your now that we have you, you now that we have you on the on the soapbox? What are your tips for pe somebody who says they want to start their own business? Now? Um, uh, it's uh, like uh, kind of like what you said earlier. It's planning. Sometimes you don't get the opportunity to plan, so just feeling um, really solid about your decision and making sure that you. Um, do your homework <laughs> about what industry you're going in, where you should, uh, the rates you should look at, um, on how to charge or what you want to do. But also, I think the big thing is, is um, it's it's easy to get lost in what everyone else is doing and think, oh my God, I got to do this, I got to do that. And I'm starting to realize more and more as I'm rounding the corner on my, you know, my little anniversary date is like, 
what do I like? What am I doing that is working for me? And then how do I want to refine it a little bit? And what, what makes me more excited to kind of, what road am I going to want to travel down a little bit? Cause I'm excited about it and just keeping true to myself. And, and really the noise is just out there. It doesn't mean you can't learn from them, but it just means that you just got to remember what works for you. What, what is authentic to you? And oftentimes I feel like the clients are the ones telling me that they're the ones saying, Oh my gosh, I just love you. Or, um, could you just come back and do my whole back office stuff for I'm like, Oh, okay. I guess I'm doing something right. Cause you like that. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I love that. I have a one-on-one -on -one client who's in Florida and every time we have a session, she always says, she always remarks, Hey, can you just come here to Florida and work out of my office? You know, like, yeah. so I can always do it's that. like the biggest reward when they say that you just want to yeah. give them a big hug. Cause you feel good about it. <laughs> Yep, and Linda Artisani says, woohoo, new 97 and upper. That's right, Linda just joined. Um, I woke up this morning to the oh. notification, so welcome, Linda. Really excited to have you with us in 97 and up. It's a great group. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Awesome. Speaking of 97 and uppers, Greg Cullop, why don't you chime in and give us your tips and guidance for somebody who says, I want to quit my job and start my own business. I am I'm all about latching on. You, you've got to get somebody who... Um, it, just what you were saying earlier, you want to find somebody who has what you want and, and you got to learn from that person. And, and if it only costs you $97 a month, then <laughs> I did not ask him to plug 97 up, but keep going. <laughs> but if it only costs you $97 a month, it's, it's the, the most no, no brainer $97 I spend every month. Right. 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 Yeah, I mean, and that's, I think that's really, you'll fall on your face a lot less often if you get the guidance of somebody who's fallen on their face already. They can kind of help you navigate the waters and make sure you don't sink, so to speak. Peggy, also one of our newest 97 and up members, I know you're just like a minute in, but that doesn't mean you don't have experience before 97 and up. What do you say to somebody who says, I want to quit my job and start my own business? Well, I think I quit my job for a totally different reason. I just did not want to be in the place I was in with more stress than I didn't want to be with it anymore. My 10 years came up December um, 10th and December 11th. I turned my resignation in. I was done, but decided I'd try my hand at running my own before I went to work. I didn't do any planning or anything else downfall right there. So I would say, yeah, you need to make sure that you're planning, that you're saving, that you're managing your money like you need to manage it. And who says something about leaner diet? <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, not just, it's a, it's, but at the same time, it felt like a weight lifted off me. So I'm doing all right. Um, I would say get with a group like this. You know, like mind people definitely um, network. I mean, I mean, even before you quit your job, start networking, start getting your name out there, start letting people know that this is what I'm doing. Uh, they appreciate the support. Um, you know, find a support system. It's a lot I would go through <laughs> that I would do different. Yeah. Great, great stuff. And. I, you know, again, I can't stress enough how important it is to put together, even if it's not a formal one, but like something like a mastermind group, you know, right. so that you can bounce. We need people to bounce things off of. Um, mm -hmm. a funny story. So one of the people that I've interviewed already for the Authentic Accountant podcast, which again is coming out August 7th, uh, guy has a really interesting story. I mean, today he's a guy who works with Fortune 500 companies and helps them build content strategies. But he was sharing the story of how he got his start in his career. And one of his earlier jobs was actually working in like the juvenile prison system, giving tours to the media to show them kind of what was going on and all that. And so, it's, you know, everybody's got a story. And I think that's another thing I want to say to somebody who's starting out as a, as a new business owner is don't lose sight of your story. You know, remember where you came from. Remember what experience you, you had to go through. Because, Peggy, I'm glad you brought that up, you know, that there's lots of different reasons we might leave a job. I mean, the reason I left my last job was because I was, truly felt I was unemployable. I mean, it, not like I was about to get fired or anything, but I hated working for somebody else. I hated the idea that I was stuck working with the people that they chose for me to work around, right? 
and that I remember I had this one manager at the last CPA firm where I worked who was a moron. I don't know how he ever passed the CPA exam. That's how I feel. <laughs> you know, and I was just, and I, and I was like, and I have to report to this guy and answer to him. And he seriously is one of the bigger morons I've met in my entire life. I'm not even kidding. Don't know how he passed the CPA exam. He, and my thought, honestly, was he must have cheated somehow. There's no way this guy had the brain power. I mean, he would come to people who had, were new at the CPA firm and say things to them like, you know, giving advice for when you go to a client to do an audit. And he would say, you know, be careful about talking about certain topics with the client, like never talk about outer space which was just like a weird thing. Like who does that anyway? And he's so never talked to a client about outer space. He would say, and never talked to them about politics. Okay. Fair enough. That's pretty obvious. But what do you think he would do at the minute we showed up at a client's office? Talk about outer I'm space. I'm not even kidding. He would talk about outer space and politics, all the things he exactly told us not to. That's do. why he didn't want you to talk about it because he wanted to talk about it. Wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> he so, wanted to talk about it. <laughs> right. So I, you know, I just realized I was really ultimately unemployable. I couldn't deal with working for somebody. And eventually it may have gone the route of me losing a job because I don't think I could deal with conforming to you know, all the corporate BS that goes on in a bigger company, you know, which is where I was in. And so I just, I realized the only way this was going to work for me is to be on my own and to be doing my own thing. And it, believe me, there have been times where I considered seriously going back and getting a job when things weren't going well, you know, and I've shared the story many times when I lost my two biggest clients. Um, and, and with that half of my annual revenue at one point, and I actually couldn't pay my bills. I couldn't, you know, not all of them. And that was when I was starting my resume. I was thinking, oh, shit, you know, this ship is sinking. I got to go do something. Um, luckily, nobody bit. You know, nobody. Uh, there was one job I thought for sure I was going to be able to get. It was like a financial analyst job with Price Waterhouse or whatever. And, uh, you know, they turned me down, whatever. I, I, and I was, I'm glad. I'm glad that they did because ultimately, and this is an important lesson I think for every business owner is, you know, and the first mistake, by the way, a lot of us think going into business is that, oh, I'm going to have all this freedom and I'm going to just, I'm going to work from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then I'm going to go sailing for the rest of the day. You know, I told my neighbor last night, I said, expect to work a lot more than you're working now working for a company with a nine to five and a check, right? You know, the that illusion is- to, That goes to Sarah's comment in the feed about clocking out at five. I was gonna say that, you've gotta make sure you want to do this because you're gonna give up a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. And yeah. but I, wanna, I wanna state very clearly though, that there's another side to this, which is in the beginning, you're gonna work your butt off, mm -hmm. but hopefully, and honestly, with the plan that I've prescribed for myself and the one that I share with my cohorts in 97 and up, but we do come back and learn how to balance it all. And there actually aren't many days these days that I'm working beyond at the very latest 6 p.m. Most days I'm done between 4 and 5 somewhere, and that gap in time from 4 to 6 is my reading time. That's the time I'm supposed to be spending reading, learning, absorbing content, reversing the engines, as I like to call it, because normally I spend so much time producing content, right? I, um, one, another thing is the first several months, I think that's when I met Gina and the SBAA people, but um, I think my biggest mistake the first few months up until April was sitting right here where I am right now. And... One day, one day I just had a epiphany. You know, if you want to meet somebody, you know, you want to meet clients, you need to go where they are. You can't meet them sitting at this desk. Yeah. So, you know, three or four days after the week, I started to actually get out and meet people. And it's been, you know, it's been a plus for me. Right. I like yeah. the ability to, for, for our position, that we can have clients anywhere in the country, but at, right. at the same time, there's there's nothing nothing like getting out. You know, even if it's just once a week and having a face to face. It doesn't have to be with a client. It doesn't even have to be with a a prospect. It could be just with somebody who you can eventually yes. uh, work with or 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 you know glean something off of. Yes. When I started, when I got to the point where I didn't have time to do all the networking stuff anymore, because there was a, you know, I did it for a long time. And then there was a point where it was taking up too much time and keeping me from actually making money because I already had a client base and so on. But what I still did was I maintained for a long time that I would try and make 
lunch plans to meet with one person at least once a week. And I usually reserved Fridays for that. And there was a restaurant in downtown Burbank that I like to go to. So as people would reach out to me, as they often do, if they were local, I'd say, hey, let's meet for lunch, right? And I'd meet them for lunch. And sometimes that would turn into business. I got a couple of clients out of it. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was really just to get out and talk to somebody. And right. Ideas. Socialize. Yes. Yeah. And that should really be the primary focus if the primary focus is oh I gotta, I'm gonna get business I'm gonna get clients it's just not gonna work you know and it's, it's like I'm sorry Seth but it's like we are as as um, small business owners we're like preschool kids you know parents have asked me do you think I should put my baby in yeah let them start learning social skills now well that's the same thing with us getting out of this house not only you know to network or whatever it's that social environment that you have to have you're going to go crazy right right i'm a social butterfly i love people sometimes yeah sometimes (laughs) keyword sometimes no um it's it's important you know and and that's why a few people have told me and i was very flattered to hear this that they really look forward to our twice weekly calls in 97 or not because it's it's our way of socializing and getting away from right. what we're the grind that we're in sitting at our computers even though we're still sitting at our computers at least we're talking kind of face to face with the cameras on and you know enjoying one another's companies um is mariette still here with us i guess not it looks like she's gone um astrid she I see out of here she was driving so i guess got she got it. to her next place okay astrid i see you lurking there do you want to unmute and Say hello. Um, right here. Good morning. Good morning. How and are I didn't you? show. I, I'm gonna show my face right now because I was a little sick and my eyes are really swollen. So excuse the face. Oh, such a beautiful <laughs> face. Too. We'll use the nice Photoshop picture. That that works better. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you've worked with the Small Business Administration, so I know you've gotten these questions. I do, and I work with a branch. Um, of the SBA, which is the SBDC in the city of Pasadena. They are a kind of like an extended arm of the SBA. And one of the things that, that I've learned with them is one of the first things they ask business owners is, um, have you sat down and talked to your family about this? And why I think that's important is that everybody that goes into opening their own business has like Peggy said, it, it, their own reason to do it, right? Mm-hmm. So um, in most cases, when we ask them that, most clients or most of their clients say, um, maybe I should go back and talk to my family and see what they think. Because whatever decision we make, the yeah. first ones affected are going to be our families. I'm right. so, so glad you said that, Astrid. Yeah. So, so it, it's something so crucial. The moment I heard it, I realized I had not had that conversation with my family. I didn't, no, and I, and I work with two, my two sisters. Um, one of them works with me full-time, the other one in a part-time basis. And my ultimate goal is to bring both of them full-time so that the three of us can work together. So I, I had a conversation with them, but I just told them pretty much, hey, I have this plan, why don't we do it? And I didn't really consult with them. But, um, but it, I think it's a very important thing to, to keep in mind. Speak to your family, consult with your family, be open about it, and, and say what your plan is. And if they're on board, chances are that things are going to be fine because you're going to have a group to rely on. Yes, your friends, but your family is important. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that, Astrid. In fact, I think it's a perfect note for us to sort of wrap things up with because we are just about out of time here. So I saved the best for last. Um, <laughs> But it, it is such an important point that because you're right, that your family is going to be directly affected by this decision. And sometimes we stop, we don't stop to consider that. How is this going to affect my family members? And what do they think? You know, I and mean, you almost think maybe it goes without saying, of course, you've had that conversation, but maybe not. So I'm glad you said that because it's important if, if we're being consulted by the person who's considering starting a new business, that we should make sure that they have taken the time to to discuss this with their family and to make sure that their family understands, hey, there's going to be struggles at times. We're going to have trouble paying the rent or the mortgage because we're going to be going through those ebbs and flows that entrepreneurs go through, especially in the beginning stages when we're just starting to build, right? And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's going to happen. There's going to be tough times. And, you know, it's that balance of 
well, is having a steady paycheck at a big company really stability or is that just an illusion because the reality is I can be let go or downsized at any time from a paying job too. At least this way I get to sort of reap what I sow. And so that's why I'm a firm believer. I almost believe everybody should just go start their businesses and leave all the big corporations and let them come crumbling down. And we should just have lots of little companies doing all this stuff. But that's, I, I realize that's not actually realistic, but that's kind of my way of joking around about it. But yes, please talk to your family members and thank you Astrid for that. Cause that was really wise advice. And Adam, Stop printing stuff. No, I'm kidding. We're talking about, <laughs> about how Adam's printing stuff in the background. And everybody's giving Adam a hard time. And uh, Adam even says, some of the trees in Oregon are crying. <laughs> Sarah Laidlaw says, when I started my business, I was supposed to partner with a tax CPA and an audit CPA. I set up the office doing write-up. And when they announced leaving their firm, we would be ready. At the last second, their wives talked them out of it. I was left with a large office and overhead. Sink or swim, I swam. And That's right. That, <laughs> before that Sarah said someone told my sister that since all her siblings and parents are business owners she should be too I did all I could to dissuade her because I know her she simply wanted a better job but was embarrassed that we all own businesses and she didn't it takes a special mindset to succeed in owning a business so the first question would be I would ask is tell me why and that's a really good point Mariette talks about that all the time um, because I think Mariette got fired up by Simon Sinek's book, which is Start With Why. There's another book to add to the list. So let's right. quickly recap the books. And the one that I forgot to mention that I've sort of loosely referenced, which was the book that started me on my most recent path creating all of this, which is called The One Minute Millionaire. And it teaches you how to think the way millionaires think one minute to the next. And it teaches you how, and Greg talked about this, it teaches you about creating that structure right? And, and they structure their time every bit as, or I should say they manage their time every bit as well and carefully as they manage their money. And I built my whole time management system based on what I learned specifically from the One Minute Millionaire because they talked about structuring your life in six major areas, body, mind, spirit, time, people, and money. And in that order, and based on that, we, I, I created an exercise where I have everybody in our program go through and actually figure out how we're going to generically structure our time. How many days a week are we going to spend on our bodies, on our, the time we spend taking care of our physical health, our mind, the time we spend learning, reading, growing in that way. Spiritual, in my case, it's meditation. You don't have to be religious to be spiritual. If you are religious, beautiful, then you already have a platform from which to dive into that part of your life, right? And then we have time, the time we spend actually organizing and managing our time. People, the time we spend with the people we care about, uh, colleagues as well as friends and family and loved ones. And then finally, money. And, and I think money's last on this list because if we take care of the first five, the money part will have a way of taking care of itself. And I found that when I actually practice this and keep my life balanced based on the structure I created through this exercise, I work a lot fewer hours, which is scary sometimes because we just talked about how hard you're going to work as an entrepreneur. But what I've learned is what I suspected and I proved it to be true in my own experience that when I am focused like that, when I'm well balanced, even though I'm working a lot fewer hours, I am so much more productive during those hours because I'm well rested, which means I'm focused, which means I'm not easily distracted, which means I get a lot more done in a lot less time. And that has been my secret formula for success for the last couple of years so that I don't have to work 80 hours a week. And I think a lot of people would be surprised if they knew how like how many hours I actually did work, I think it would prove to be a lot less than what most people would suspect because people are always telling me, Seth, I think there's four of you. How do you do all that you do? And the answer is structure and balance. I think those two words really sum it up perfectly. Structure and balance. And thank you, everyone, for your input and contribution today. I think this was great stuff. I hope people watch it and get a lot out of it. And come back next week because next week we're going to talk about my tips and tricks for content creators. Oh, I can't wait for that <laughs> Yes. I listed the books um, on our channel. On Slack, I saw that. Thank you. So I will post those when I publish the episode on my website tomorrow. Okay. So for those in 97 and up, we, you know, we have a Slack workspace, and there's a channel called Zoom In with Seth. Sarah is our scribe, and she writes the notes and puts it in there whenever I remember to suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> Greg, you're All up right. next. I'm going to pass the baton to you. Right. Greg's <laughs> going to be our scribe next Friday. All right. Thank you all. Have an amazing Friday. Have an amazing weekend. Don't forget to join Gina's Hangout. Go to SBAA 
on Facebook. Join the group if you're not already in it. And Gina will give you all the details for how to join her hangout later today, which I believe it starts at 2 p.m. off recording. Then by 2.30, it's decided what the subject will be. And then they go live for, uh, what is it, a half an hour or an hour at that point? Um, half an hour. It's 5 o'clock my time, right? Yeah, so just join it. Go there, be there, do it. Don't miss out. That can be how you start to put together your group of mentors like we talked about this morning. Oh, yeah, that's about. All right. Thank you, everybody. And it's good. See you all on the other side. Bye. Bye.